Welcome to the Caribbean Property Investing Podcast, where we share real-life experiences for successful Caribbean property entrepreneurs. Learn about their successes, challenges, and strategies to help you create your plan for financial freedom. Now let's get started. Welcome to episode eight of the Caribbean Property Investing Podcast. We want to thank you for all of the support you've shown to date in liking our videos, uh, as well as downloading the podcast, um, Instagram, and all the social media um, interaction. Today is the second interview in our special series celebrating the International Month of Women. Today we have a special guest, Mrs. Uh, Debbie, Deborah Tobia, uh, entrepreneur, developer, and I'd like to give a, a round, rousing welcome to the second episode in our Women in Property series. Good afternoon, Debbie, and welcome. Good afternoon, Handsome, and thank you very much <laughs> for that welcome. I, I'm so excited uh, about having you uh, because you know I've been, I've been, I've been mm -hmm. watching a long time. Uh, you are quite prominent in the south of Saint Lucia, especially. Um, as it relates to being a leader, a female leader, a, a lady leader, leader uh, in entrepreneurship and industry. I don't want to say too much. I want to turn over the mic to you and tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, yes, well, I always like to say, Anselm, that I started um, as a retailer, primarily. Um, actually, back in 1998 is when we opened our business, True Valley Building and Hardware Supplies. I think over the years, because we became very knowledgeable in the industry, in the service of our customers, um, I kind of realized that there was a need, there was a demand for housing. Um, and I wanted to do it in a way that would enhance what we already do, but not in a way that would interfere with the relationships that we've built over the years with our contractors. Okay. So whilst I wanted to ensure that I'm expanding my investment portfolio into something that seems pretty um you know pretty obvious that you'd want to get into because you have inherent advantages you know you're a supplier um but also that we wanted to do it in a way that we would go into raw land development so that we would not be perceived as competing directly with the people who make up our business which are the contractors right so i think um back in 2009 we we're looking for land development and i think i took on at that time a little bit more than we expected. We were looking at a, a 10 acre parcel. Um, it was at a time that, again, if we looked at what real estate prices were, then um, everybody was quoting in US dollars. Um, there was a boom in real estate sales. And of course, I think everybody thought, um, well, in fact, maybe in the Caribbean region, we had not been affected yet by the global financial crisis or the impact after 2008. So maybe the timing was not the best. But what it did for us is I was able to garner a lot of experience. Um, land development is not an easy thing, as I'm sure you appreciate, especially when you're looking at raw land. The land is beautiful. Um, it's located in, in where we call the Savans Bay area, which is just maybe about 10 minutes outside of Viewfort. And um, we saw this 18.68 acre parcel um, with a realtor, and I fell in love with it. Um, not even looking at the nuances and all of the costs and expenses, we put in an offer and it was a considerable investment. At the time it was 3.4 million, 3,437,000 to be exact. And I also negotiated bridge financing of a million dollars because obviously it's raw land. It's a bit elevated from the road. And then of course we find out so many things that we did not know at the time that we purchased, we negotiated loans and so on. <clears throat> we find out that the land is in fact landlocked so then we go into negotiations with the landlord owner below the property and ultimately had to acquire um, 90 um, meters of land just to gain access to our first 3.4 acres onto a connector, which also required negotiations with an adjacent landowner because the two lots were not connected. <laughs> so, and this was all after the fact. On the map sheet, it actually showed that it was connected. Um, so we also got into an arrangement with the landowner that um, in exchange for using our infrastructure through phase one, that they would grant us access in a triangle 
and about 10,000 square feet of land so we could access the upper 15 acres, which we would propose that would be our data community. Long story short, um, and some over years, let's say years 2009, the property is acquired. 2011 was when we actually did a launch. That's after going through architectural designs. And then of course, evaluating the actual cost of construction. We broke around in May of 2011. And um, <clears throat> we built our model home at the end of the year to the following year. And we launched our model home whilst we were undertaking um, civil works and so on was when it was actually being constructed. Um, so we launched it in December of 2012. At the time, Anselm, I think many thought that I was very innovative because we would host, um, you know, the, first the launch, the, the start turning. We had the, um, the launch at Coconut Bay Resort in the conference room. And then that was in May of 2011. Then we had this um, cocktail for the opening of the model home. We got news coverage as well. Then in March of the following year, we actually had a cocktail again, targeting the groups that we felt um, had the experience to market the investment, um, be it lawyers, um, bankers, realtors, of course, and so on, right? Um, even having done that, um, we had in the first year of launch about five sales. One ultimately fell off um, because of finance constraints, and we did five builds, including the model home. And then it kind of went cold after that. Now, fortunately for us, um, yes. <clears throat> Just to summarize some of that, so you fall in love with this piece of property, um, and yes. as you pro pro progress down the developmental process, you're realizing that there was some some challenges and a major, and most significant one was access. You didn't have access, yes, and you had to work through that. Yes. But before that, you actually said that in initially thinking of going into development. You were in many mm -hmm. hats as a retailer. Mm -hmm. You also did not Correct. want to destroy the relationship you had with the the contractors as well by going now into a field that and competing with them eventually. How, yes. how did you pacify uh, fellow contractors who were your retail customers uh, about the project? Mm -hmm. Well, the focus was for us to always maintain um our culture in the business um i will tell you that there would have been individuals that we knew for many years before who were very good customers and they did feel a bit offended that we did not subcontract the couple of contracts that we had initially um now imagine i mean we have many good customers so it would be literally impossible to give every good customer a contract so i i'm sure there was a little bit of contention a little bit of fallout in the initial years. But over time, I believe that people would understand that it takes a pretty hefty upfront investment for a project of that scale because it's a raw land development. Um, even having been in business myself at the time for maybe, let's say in 2009, so you're talking 11 years, um, it would have been my reputation as a borrower um, that put me in a position as well because this was just at a time that the banks were becoming very wary of raw land development. And it posed a little bit of an issue for me because despite getting the loan in principle, um, acquiring the property, when it came to have the add-on loan of the bridge finance, I had to go to the then uh, managing director, Norton, um, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> Nordstrom, Nordstrom to, yeah. yeah, Nordstrom to actually sell him again on something that in discussions, we already were comfortable that we would get because we understood that you have a elevator piece of land. If you don't have a road going there, you're not going to walk up in bush to try and get a prospective buyer to see your vision. So the first phase was really to get us acquainted with the cost of development. Excavation costs, I mean, they can be excruciating because that's heavy equipment. We did not own our own equipment. And those are areas that you have to very carefully evaluate um, when you go into land investment. Um, but we had to renegotiate to gain that finance and it gave us the ability to simultaneously put, bring up roads, we cut the roads and then we were bringing up this project, which incidentally, the project was financed in um, mine and my husband's private names as like a personal asset, you know, so, Correct. but um, what, what happened really is that um, the business, um, it was true value and it was actually my parents at the time, Builder's Choice 
we partnered with each other because I had to consider other things, Anselm. Um, for example, if you look at the life of a loan that's amortized for 15 years, and let's say if I remember figures correctly, um, we would approximate $30,000 a month over 15 years for the 3039000 net of any deposit that we made at the time. Yeah. Uh, so um, 30000 And then, of course, you have the bridge finance component as well. Um, I elected a couple of years thinking, again, the first year that it looked like, hey, we're going to average three to four sales a year minimum. We've had this launch. Um, you know, we've already built a very nice model home property. So we can really leverage and say, hey, I can anticipate at least, I mean, three, four sales a year. But when it did not happen, uh, my parents were good enough to come on board. They had a lot of faith in me, in my vision. Um, they bought into the entire concept. And they even agreed when I told them, hey, let us try and pay 40 grand between the two businesses. So 20 grand and 20 grand um, so that we could actually mitigate the interest expense on the overall loan. Um, I think that yes. in my analysis, we saved something like $1.8 million in interest by actually paying upfront the way that we did, you know, for, for as long as we did. Could you imagine? Because if you're buying the land and you have the bridge financing, a lot of people do not understand that the cost of land development is very significant. And particularly um, when you look at topographical conditions, um and of course proximity to main roads right um you would know and some there are a lot of people who have maybe been very well intended they got into land investment and they didn't carefully analyze so this is what i do in a nutshell i say to anybody who seeks my advice based on my experiences <clears throat> i tell them like this when you buy the price of land and let's just use um you know figures as examples let's say you're looking at 10 acres of land um your acquisition costs um, depending on a lot of things, again, topography, you know, challenges to actually subdivide the land and so on. But your acquisition cost should not be anything more than $4 a square foot. Um, you typically, depending on the type of infrastructure you're putting in, will spend anywhere between 7 to $9 a square foot. But that is only on the land that will be the net land that's yielded after you've given up your open space, um, which is 5% required as per um, Development Control Authority, and after another maybe 11 to 12.5% for your road network, which would be either a 7 point, I'm sorry, 8.2 meter or 9.2 meter access, right? Meaning that 27 foot wide road carriageway, I'm sorry, road reserve, even if the carriageway itself is only 16 feet wide but you would have to allow for that so that you can install your U drains, your box drains and your carbon slipper and so on, okay? Now, when you assess that and you realize you're losing land off the top, you have to accurately determine what would be your yield on the net land in terms of what the sale price would be. So if land in the area, your comparatives show that you're going to be able to sell develop land with proper concrete road infrastructure. In our case, we chose to go with underground utilities, which is considerably more costly than overhead. Yes, but, so more are, but, but, but more aesthetically pleasing for sure. Yes, definitely. Okay, it comes at a significant cost, but we went all underground. So excavation is required. Um, the utility companies would require that you provide your six inch ducts throughout and then they would run their armored ca um, cables or their telecoms, right? Um, supply. So, uh, and then of course, water is a whole other story. <laughs> we had other challenges where we could not, even though we had our domestic supply installed according to um, required specifications, we found, well, not found, I kind of knew because I live in the area as well, Anselm, um, there was not sufficient supply for a new development, even if we met um, Wasco's conditions and criteria. So they would come and inspect and they would say, okay, well, we can, we can pass your infrastructure. We can do the pressure testing, everything. However, we have a two inch main coming from the stadium area to um, your gap, meaning that there's already insufficient supply. So we can't give you any connections. Now, one of the good things was, is I had decided that I'm going to do a water cistern in every single build because I lived in the area and had we not had a water cistern under our foundation, we would not have had water because it was many years later that we were able to tap onto um, Mrs. Bonnie Zephyrin's mains, which is a little lower down Kessels in Paradise, 
and we were able to um, get our single residents connected. So as a safe, um, fail safe, we did that and it's a standard that we have carried um, through our other investments. And um, it also, I mean, we hear about all of the severe drought, um, you know, drought situations. I think last year we experienced a very long extended drought. And there are a lot of people that despite where they may be living in the Castries area, it could be Rodney Bay, it could be, you know, Kappa State, a lot of people have to live through those kind of inconveniences associated with the water shortages, right? Um, typically, we include about 8,000 gallons minimum of um, cisterns um, water storage, and it has put us in a better position to contend with the realities at play. And then it, now it's great because we do have Wasco supply. We have municipal supply at this time. So, I mean, this has been um, something that evolved over, what are we now, Anselm? Um, we're in 2021, okay? I would never have thought that 12 years later, um, we will be talking that we have met all of our objectives as land developers, despite the fact that we've only had very modest sales. I mean, the, the four sales I spoke of, um, we were able to leverage and I mean, fight with our bank to ask them for things like a land lot sale for a local manufacturer who entrusted us with his dream home and basically say to the bank, listen, for that 760 linear feet I need, I need you to release the entire, don't put a, a, a ratio on me based on your interest in the lot sale. Give me the ability to actually furnish road um, access to this buyer. And, you know, so we got that. And in every um, sale, we actually used the net proceeds to continue the road all the way up the development. And that was also critical because although anybody looking at the investment would say it is a non-viable investment um, to a day like today, but guess what? We're at the tail end of it. We can now um, stand for and complete what we intended to because we have mitigated the risk adequately. And we're in a position that in um, 2014, I decided to do a soft launch on another development. I can tell you, and some, some people, my very close friends thought I was nuts. Debbie, aren't you catching your, you know, what's on the other side there? What yeah. are you doing with another development? I mean, there were people, I, I again, I don't want to the next development yet. I have a question on, on the last one. Two questions. Okay, because I, I want to make sure that we, yeah. we, 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 I want to make sure, so it's a lot of information for you and I, but I want to make sure that we, we, offer some clarification and some things that I think people might be asking. Um, the mm. first one was the difference between the interest rate of the, the original loan and the bridge financing. Typically, is yeah. bridge financing at the premiums. It's more, it's a, a few more points, right? This is usually a little more. Bridge financing can be more. I think in my case, it was maybe one interest point more. Ordinarily, the bank would want you to pay that in the short term. So your cash flow projections would present anticipated sales at you know whatever trends you um, you um, expect. And um, in our case, it did not happen. So we ultimately consolidated with the capital loan. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and the second question was the issue was the disbursements when the GFC mm -hmm. uh, happened. Did the bank decide then to? Mm -hmm to hold back some of the disbursements? Um, well, the way that they would um, look at it with land, despite the fact that we had advanced payments, so we were accelerating payments on the loan facility, um, they would always want to apportion. So if the bank deems that based on what we should realize in returns on the sale, their interest is about 40%, um, they will want to retain 40% of each sale so that they protect their um, their interest. I mean, you would know of certain um, investments that um, while sales of units may have been occurring, the bank did not get the portion, the proportionate amount associated with the initial capital financing um, that was granted. So in that case, they would want to ensure that we are paying for the push of land that they finance for us, right? But I, I was able to convince them and we were able to bring our words all the way up to the cul-de-sac. Um, it's beautiful land, it's beautiful perspectives. And um, it's why I went into middle income when I realized how slow Emerald Vista was. Um, I wanted to reach a target market of local professionals and retain, returning nationals. Now, um, it was on 5.5 acres that we had actually acquired at a lower price, considerably lower, um, back in 2007. Um, so when we did our soft launch, it was just launching concepts and they were more modern. I, 
actually came up with um, my daughter's home, which I changed the designs a little bit where it still kind of is on the foundation of our original designs. Um, our architectural designs seek to um, lend some convenience to the homeowner. So a simple concept, you drive into your, your garage, you walk through your mudroom right into your kitchen, you have the dining room laid out if your guests come through the entry foyer and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like it's um, L-shaped or U-shaped houses, right? Now, um, when we launched, we actually undertook the roadworks in 2016. So Anselm, this was five years ago, January, 2016. And um, in the five year period, we have sold probably 25 lots because there were a few that were granted through deed of donation and so on. But all 30 lots are off the market right now in five years. And I mean, thank you, thank you. I mean, to, to be able to achieve that, especially getting your blows on the other side, I think is significant. Um, it also means that there's a level of resilience that you're taking away what you learn from the other investment and you're becoming better for it, okay? So you can now even manage your costs more effectively. You can become more efficient. Um, you can estimate um, what you will encounter because you've gained the experience. So instead of having it some be something that beats you down, you're going to use it to your advantage, okay? Now, in this case, um, we design a road, um, domestic road supply that took into consideration two roads on the outside of the five acres, right? Um, so we have met our conditions. Um, I mean, our responsibilities expressly as developers, but because now people knew what we achieved on the other side, and with the more modern concepts and the fact that we can build in six months, we got a lot of interest from inception. And I was kind of toying with the idea of getting into um, short-term finance, like bridge finance with SLDB at 8%. And I'm so glad I didn't, you know, I was thinking, okay, well, let me just take it. If I prepay it, no problem, you know, whatever. But because when we launched, we got a couple of initial sales and this is raw land. Huh? So these are people who are putting in your hands, maybe $108,000 for a 6,000 square foot lot, right? Or whatever the Good case price. may be. So, yes. And you're leveraging those proceeds again, through prudent financial management and discipline, financial discipline. And everything you're getting is going back into your excavation, your compacting, your supply of drains and all the other um, infrastructural um, upgrades, right, in the area. So um, I'm actually now, it's it's funny because I was thinking that this um, podcast is timely because I am i haven't made up my mind yet, but I'm just an idea of acquiring some 4.96 um, acres, just half an acre less than um, Bombay's. Just because even though it's um, two parcels owned by the same individual who's based in the UK, it is en route to Palmy's Cove. And I've made a commitment to my residents, um, notwithstanding it did not happen the way I would have hoped, Anselm, that we would do an upgrading of the roads, which is approximately maybe 2,000 linear feet of roads at this point. Um, just piggybacking on an initiative that we undertook many years ago in 2014, where I live, and they were going up to Castles in Paradise. And um, it was a very nice example of, you know, somebody bringing everybody together, but also using their knowledge um, and, you know, in-house expertise um, to the benefit of an entire community. I mean, we literally um, raised $305,000 in varying amounts. Um, and um, we were able to put in all of the roads that the ministry valued at $800,000. So imagine when I went to Ministry of Infrastructure to get their endorsement of the upgrade, they looked at me like, you can't do that. And it's the exact same scope of works. There's not a compromise. Now, whilst I agree, and some anybody who is granted a ministry contract would expect there would be a measure of profit. And maybe obviously because of my type management, I would have, you know, costs of uh, um, costs, supply costs and, and so on. But I mean, I don't expect it to be two and a half times. These are the things that what you said at the start of your show um, that make it difficult. It makes it difficult for people to even consider doing the right thing, whether it's family land and a family comes together. And by the time they start looking at the prospect of putting the road from the main road to the, you know, uh, 20 acres of land, they already lose interest because some subcontractor is um, claiming that it's going to cost them multi millions of dollars. 
So like you were saying, if we're sharing knowledge, we make things more feasible because we make it more attainable because again, we take the guesswork out of it. I mean, if a contractor is making a modest, you know, let's say 25, 30%, they may get more contracts because now it becomes something that somebody might um, realistically consider as opposed to being something that's cost prohibitive. Uh, I think I think what we're trying to do here is demystify that, but also show people that there is they, they have power. The fact that you can actually mm -hmm. call up somebody and ask uh, ask about the experience, you can research, mm -hmm. and even for the costing, nobody should ever even take not even two costs, not even two quotes. I think you should get a minimum yes. of three, but ask more mm -hmm. more people. One of the first things that struck me when you started. Uh, with the first mm -hmm. 3.4, 3 I think, acres for uh, Emerald Vista, I was saying, like, yeah. okay, where, where is the, the knowledge coming from? Isn't there fear? Isn't there trepidation? But just hearing you yeah. speak, and I'm sure our audience will, will see that, you know, what gave you the, the courage to feel like, even if you had, mm -hmm. not, you, 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 you had not done major development, that even with the high price point, capital costs, that it would still be okay and you were tackling the first development was high end and the second one was was kind of middle family what gave you that what gave you that confidence to 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 still go ahead and so, um i can tell you i'm turning 50 this year now looking back at some of the things i've done and the level of risk i've taken i'm starting to think that in my old age i'm getting risk of this <laughs> Because, I mean, even with the knowledge and experience and the fact that I have been able to manage that amount of debt successfully, despite, you know, the fact that we had um, no sales at Emerald Vista, we're going to launch another development. Um, I think that I always believe in doing the right thing, you know, applying the same principles that work for you in your retail business and applying those fundamentals to any other related investment that you embark on. For example, um, what we're doing is like we're keeping our, our construction in-house as well, right? Now, again, people might not understand why, Anselm. We're not doing it to not give jobs to another contracting firm. We're doing it to ensure that a particular standard is achieved and it's maintained, it's improved upon. So, for example, um, you know, our guys, we have a core group of guys, maybe about a dozen guys, right? I have tried to institute a standard where um, electively, we the same way that we pay our wages to our guys. I mean, think about it, you run projects as well, right? And some, you're not gonna find a time a fortnight comes and you forget to time keep for somebody and then you don't pay one of the fellas, right? So you will do your due diligence. <laughs> you will do your due diligence. Make sure you have your records in place, right? And then your foreman is giving you timesheets and stuff. You do your checks and then you pay them. So I've instituted a process that our following Friday is our fortnight, meaning that working with my usual suppliers, um, you know, who I partner with over the years, be it Will Rock for concrete and blocks, um, True Value, you know, um, we supply of all of the hardware and lumber and so on, that we pay as we go. So it means also that your accounts office is reaching out and getting people to send statements. But more importantly, what it really means is that you have a full command. So whether it is one contract that you're running or multiple contracts, at all times, you're going to know what your cash flows are, what is um, the, the next payment due from a particular client, what stage you're at, what your expenditure is. Because one of the things that I would really like, um, I always say, Ansem, we have a very highly unregulated construction industry, okay? A lot yeah. of people, they don't yeah. aspire raise good standards um you know they may have the very same materials they have the same block they have the same hammer they have the same uh you know paintbrush and just because of their application methods the quality of the finish will be entirely different right but in this case if you're self-regulating um you're able to ensure that the money is used for what it's intended i would say if i give advice to contractors the money's not yours let's say you're building a, a 600,000 square foot very nice um, modern home, like what we have done at Palmy School, we're incidentally on our 13th build right now in the five years, you know, having um, sold out all the land. Um, you would want to be in a position that when you come to the high end um, expenses, you're not depleted based on the phase payments that a bank will make to you, because then now you're looking at the 
high-end kitchen, the granite supply, the tiles, the paint and finishes, right? Um, you should only be able to realize your profit at the end of the project. I'm talking about your profit other than what you would pay yourself and your crew and stuff. So if you have an administrative fee um, set aside. So, I mean, those are self-imposed standards that will ensure um, success. It will ensure that you can manage multiple projects and know where you are as it relates to where you need to be and that you can meet your objectives. And as you may know, um, Anselm, the unfortunate reality is there are people who are making what may be the biggest investment in their lifetime. And then because of the mismanagement of their contractor, they're actually at the end of their mortgage and the house is not finished, you know? So again, industry knowledge is all of the things. I mean, you know, I acquainted myself with a lot of things early on. You were saying about getting comparative quotes, like from maybe three different contracting firms. How about this? How about just learning some of the standards and honing it back? I mean, it's not like you're trying to shop and tell them you can't make any money on this, but how good is it to know that, let's say even in a road, supply, you can make a quick calculation and say, okay, linear feet by um, width of road. So you have a thousand feet of road by let's say 16 feet wide. Um, so 1600 um, square feet uh, multiplied by 0.5 because it's six inches thick. So it's 0.5 of a cubic feet divided by 27, three by three by three. And that's your cubic measure of your reinforced concrete that you require. Same thing um, to, for a concrete slab for a decking right? Um, except for accounting for the concrete that goes into the reinforced beams. See, it puts you in a powerful position because concrete not going anywhere else, Anselm, it going to your project because you can actually estimate the cost of those things. Now, you know, there will be something like, you know, on our website, CaribbeanPropertyInvesting.com, we have a, a link uh, called Property School. So we probably can get you on mm -hmm. as a lecturer there. Um, <laughs> so look at the two projects. Look at the two projects. Mm -hmm. Just in yes. summarizing, what would you say maybe were your three, the three biggest challenges that you face? Mm. Just overall. Um, I think, I mean, the biggest challenges, um, I would say by far um, was the fact that in the case of Emerald Vista, um, that we did not have those sales coming. That we basically had to carry the investment and we still had to be creative in ways of leveraging whatever we did. If it was just the profit we made on a particular build, we put it back into that, right? Um, the second challenge um, I would say is working with, and I think a lot of developers can say the same, but working with the various agencies, um, notwithstanding your intention to do the right things and to ensure that the correct standards are instituted um, in the construction of your infrastructure. Um, what I find sometimes is that there are different standards that different people are held to. Um, in the case of Pommy School, it was very, very difficult for me to obtain full approval um, for the um, mm -hmm. infrastructure. And that was despite my experience at Emerald Vista. I mean, I, if I had the chief engineer, let's say from um, Ministry of Infrastructure, um, deem that there are certain flaws in the development, they write a report of 30 things. We on it like, you understand? Just to get that thing done because we want to address it. We want to do the right things by our um, future buyers and to ensure that going forward, these are not failings on our part, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you have that, that kind of cooperation from a developer. You know, there are a lot of other places that um, there wasn't even that intention to put in investment after land was sold for actual develop prices, you know? Um, the third thing would be the little nuances of, I mean, and this, this is something typical to what I do and I just have to understand it comes with the territory um, and some, but basically you probably have experienced it. Um, people come in, uh, somebody might say, hey, I'm buying a piece of land from you, 10,000 square feet, you're giving me a, a concessionary rate, it's 150 grand, you put in your escrow account, you're going through the deed processing, bam, life changes, I'm going through a divorce with my husband and you refund that entire amount. So, I mean, you really cannot count your chickens before they hatch. The other thing is to be focused on meeting commitments and ensuring that there's separation of financial activities. So you don't find yourself in a compromising position as it relates to what you have to deliver for um, a client who has made a purchase. I, mean, I heard you say something earlier about 40% um, mm -hmm. of the the, the, the sales uh, sale proceeds mm -hmm. going to the bank first 
Um, I wasn't so privileged um, for for my small development, obviously, obviously on a much smaller scale. All of the proceeds yes. would go to the bank before they release title. In in my ah. opinion, I think it's better that way. I think it's better that way because ah. you, you know for a fact that once that's done, if you did did your financial planning properly, then you don't have to yes. worry about delinquency. So you know once yes. once you've gotten that sale and you've covered your your, your cost, it's all profit going forward mm -hmm. and maybe you know I, I was going to say maybe it's it's a, a male thing we want less less trouble less drama which brings me to my mm -hmm. next question about yes. women in property um mm -hmm. from from your experience mm -hmm. do you think that there are any differences in how women are treating property do you think it's more challenging for them what are some of the hurdles that you think that women face that men don't face just your view on on the distinction between a man or woman in our area. Okay, so now, Ansem, I, I don't want to offend you here. Okay, um, this is something that during my my stint um, as a government senator as well, right? I don't think that people ever really felt that I said the things that I needed to say on behalf of women, um, you know, or I highlighted a lot of the trials because. My view is this, I have always felt that women are inherently better placed to do well in business, to do well in corporate positions, to do well in land development or whatever career they choose because of their ability to multitask, their organizational skills, their financial management skills and so on. So I've never acted like because I am a woman that I should expect any favors, that I should expect that I'm going to be um, treated any differently. I've always gone after the things that I want and I've tried to position myself to be able to obtain those things fairly, right? Now, um, I guess in our office, it's kind of like that. I mean, wasn't it a few years ago that um, in the was the Caribbean re region, I think it was Jamaica, St. Lucia, um, was it Colombia? And they found that there was a higher percentage of women in um, managerial positions yes. um, than men, right? Yes. So, I mean, we need to assume our rightful place, um, notwithstanding the role that men play, you know? But I really think that, you know, the capacity that we have um, puts us in a place where we can do very well. I mean, that just think about a woman who is managing her household and she has to uh balance her checkbook and she has to be able to provide for the house and um you know maybe try and get some money from her husband and so on right i mean those are skills so definitely i have never felt that as a woman i mean maybe it happens i'm not saying no i'm not trying to in any way discount the fact that it does happen i mean i have had instances i'm just saying that i don't that's not my focus so i'm not gonna act like oh, okay uh, i'm a lady they always treat me they never take me seriously and stuff like that because whatever you give out is what you're gonna get and some so, I mean, you know, you're not going to act like, hey, um, I am due other privileges or recognition because I happen to be female. Um, you know, I would say that you expect the best of yourself and you put yourself in the position to attain what you set out to achieve. I was brought up by a single mother and very, very strong uh, female figures, mm -hmm. my grandmother, my aunts. What advice do you have for yes. anyone seeing this podcast for the first time and had a notion of you know property investing uh, or, or, or doing something more towards the financial freedom what advice would you have for, for, for somebody listening or watching um i would say just like you said a while ago is to seek i mean do the research seek the information acquaint yourself with you know every aspect of it you become formidable and you're able to do better when you acquaint yourself with what you're engaged in i mean as much as you may feel that hey i'm going to get somebody who has the expertise it's be it a civil engineer or you know a land surveyor or whoever um i think it's always better um to put yourself in a position that you can direct the show because you gain adequate knowledge of what you're engaged in Awesome. And for persons looking and listening, wanting more information about the developments, where can they get more information uh, on, on those two developments, Emerald Vista and Palmis Cove? Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, for Emerald Vista, it's www.emeraldvista.com. 454-1000 can reach both developments. Um, like I was saying that um, if we do go ahead with this um, second part, I'm thinking of a Palmis Gardens. Um, it's a little bit lower, but it's en route to Palmis Cove. Um, and it's really just on the basis that despite 
the fact that you know the whole world has gone through um, the economic challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, that I mean, by all means, um, demand will return. So again, you want to get ahead of that and continue um, leveraging your resources and looking at what has worked for you so that you're well positioned when the rebound occurs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Debbie. Uh, an awesome, awesome um, points given. For me, you know, my, my key takeaway is to become even more involved in the details. And Robert Kiyosaki said it well, when he said one of the key aspects of being a successful entrepreneur is minding your own, own business. And from everything that you mm -hmm. said, it's it's incumbent on you. It's actually your responsibility to find out as much detail about every aspect of the development process as possible, notwithstanding the challenges that you will face. So you've been watching another episode of the Caribbean Property Investing Podcast. This month is a special month as we celebrate women in property. Until next time, mm -hmm. check us out on www.caribbeanpropertyinvesting.com. Congratulations and thank you for tuning in to the Caribbean's first property investing podcast. We want to help Caribbean people create wealth and achieve financial freedom through property investing. Our show provides general advice based on personal experiences and is for educational purposes only. For more information, resources and past episodes, visit us at CaribbeanPropertyInvesting.com. Remember to click the subscribe button so you never miss a show. Let's go.